The Dataflow Mapping Tool is a complete software solution which enables you to track and understand how your organisation processes personal data. This makes it much easier to be compliant with both the GDPR and the ISO 27001. In this video, I'll demonstrate just a few of the key tools available within the software. Specifically, I will cover user classification fields, asset management, creating a new process, the map toolbar asset library, map creation, asset attribute panels and third country transfers, and finally, the process reports. This is intended as a brief overview, but a full tutorial is also available on our YouTube channel. The Data Flow Mapping Tool allows users to add in their own custom classification fields as well as custom regions. Along the top here, we have free text areas where you can either modify or update the current classification types such as confidential, private or public. We've added in our own additional areas such as sensitive and highly restricted. And to add on your own custom classification field, we simply click add another classification field. Another box will enter and we can now type in exactly what that field is going to be. If we want to make it so that this isn't actually an available option right now, we can toggle it off and turn it back on as the organization's administrator further down the line. The next stage under our settings menu for the data flow mapping tool is the ability to add on custom regions on top of custom classifications. Down the bottom here, we already have one in place, which is Microsoft Azure in Ireland. However, you may want to choose another custom location uh, if you want to be more specific on maybe the state where that information is being kept or a certain area within the European Union. Below here, we simply click on Add Custom Region, and then we would enter in the custom location followed by the actual specific area where that information is being kept. So you may want to enter in something like Kansas, followed by the location being the US, and then that will be followed by the EEA status, whether it's EEA, non-EEA, or whether there's been an EC adequacy decision made. As part of the data flow mapping tool, we've added the ability for users to upload their own asset registers. On top of this, you're also able to create assets from within the tool without having to use a preloaded Excel document. To do so, we simply click on Create New at the top here. We can choose from an asset type, whether that's a local storage, whether that's seen to be a server or a cloud application. You'll then be asked to enter the reference as to how it is named within your organization and this is a free text box and doesn't need to be pre-populated beforehand. The next option is then for you to choose what it's going to be operating as, whether it is seen as a controller, a joint controller or a processor of your information. The final selection on here will be its location with the more commonly used areas within the tool up to date will be pulled to the top to build for repeatability uh, for the future. Next to there, we have the option for you to import assets that was aforementioned at the beginning. By clicking on import assets, we can download the Excel template for you to then populate with your own information. Or if you already have a pre-existing asset library, that can be drag and dropped into the tool and it will seamlessly import itself. Over here on the left hand side, if we choose one of our pre-existing assets that are already built into the product, we simply click on company sales website, for example, you'll have a breakdown as to what the asset type is being indicated as. In this case, it's a web application. We then have the number of records that are being stored on that asset, followed by what it is operating and its location. Below there, we have the ability to show any relationships with ISO 27001 controls, any related legal requirements from the EU GDPR or UK law, if there's any outstanding tasks related to this asset, which processes this asset is being used in, a message board slash audit trail to show any modifications that have been made to this asset, as well as an area for you to add additional comments to users of the portal. And finally, you have another area where you can associate assets to each other to again view or show that relationship between two areas of your business. Towards the top here, you have the ability to delete an asset and that will take a global change across the rest of the portal. We can edit our assets from this menu. We can close all but one. We can minimize this back into the side panel and we also have the ability to run a report at an asset level to include the records, the processes and any other additional information. 
Creating a process within the Dataflow mapping tool couldn't be simpler. It also gives you the ability to assign a process to a predefined group. By clicking Create New, we can choose from existing groups within our organization. Alternatively, we can create a new group, which would require you to give the group a name, a subtitle, followed by its description. Once this has been completed, it will look very similar to what we can see on screen at this moment. And by selecting the process, this will then pull it over into the middle area for you to then work on those same six areas that we have looked at earlier under the asset management screen, such as showing related ISO controls, legal requirements, tasks, processes, message boards, and also associated assets. And should we need to change the process at any given point, we simply choose the edit button at the top here, and we can come back through and make modifications to its title, who the process owner is, what the process owner is acting as, the scope statement, followed by the purpose of processing. Once we're happy with all of this information, we simply click save, and this will return us back to allow us to progress into mapping out our data for that process. Once the process has been successfully created, we can then move on into the process map itself. Along the top here, we have the ability to export the end report into a Word document for further modification. We've got the end report that can be printed directly from the browser. We have further editing options over here on the middle and left hand side to include the ability to comment anywhere within the map itself to create connections between assets to each other, move the existing assets already on screen and also the hand tool to select the individual points of the map. On the far left hand side we have the ability to zoom in and out, remove, duplicate or undo and redo any modifications we've made to the process so far. On the far left hand side we have access to our pre-existing asset library. The first option is to add a new asset. This is in addition to the asset management system we covered earlier. We have the option to add a new data input and there is no limit to these that can be added to the process map. We have the option to add on a data subject to show the return of information to an area or a subject of the business. We then have a search box which allows us to quickly search for our pre-existing asset library and to populate the map with any of these items we simply single click and it will populate the next available space or we can drag and drop these icons into a more specific area of the map. Once the process has been created, map creation is simply a matter of dragging items from our left hand side asset library onto the map canvas and creating those connections. To do so, we can drag and drop these icons onto the map canvas like so, using our first point as a data entry point, followed by which asset that is next going to come into contact within our business. And then we can also show the transfer of existing items within our business from asset to asset. Once these items are on screen, we can collapse the side panel to make it easier and a larger workspace available and use our connection tool to create these beginning connections and the beginning of our process map. Once this has been built, you will soon find yourself in an area where your process map will start taking more of a shape as we can see on screen here. The connection point from our first data entry point going to our company sales website can be edited or populated as we can see on the right hand side attributes panel at the moment. We can see that we've set our data source to be a data subject. Our reference is our customers in the EU. And again, this is a custom area that you can freehand text into. You'll then have your method of the information join in your process, be that backup, career, download, internet, or other if there's something more niche to your own business requirements. The next option is an area where you're going to choose the data items you're going to be handling. At the top here, we have two areas for lawful basis, followed by exception, with drop downs to choose the associated consideration as to why you're taking that information. Below there, we have our data items selected in highlighted green, and these will be broken into both personal and sensitive data items, and this will be the same for data subjects as well. At the bottom of each of these areas, you'll have an area for other where you can input additional information if there's something in these comprehensive lists that isn't already included. Once we're happy with the data items we're dealing with, we simply click OK. It will highlight the number of data items currently entering into our process map. There'll be another area to add comments to the transfer, as well as if there's any data encryption at this point as well. Once we're happy with this, we can hit apply. It will confirm 
and all of this information would then have been updated on the process map itself. The next stage is to show the transfer of existing data items between assets, not necessarily data inputs. We're going to select this connection here, where there will be a reduced number of options to choose from. The first one is still going to be present and that will be the method in which the information is moving. We have these same options, as well as other at the bottom. We can then choose from pre-existing data items within our process map, with an indicator as to which asset they're coming from, the data item, the lawful basis, and also the data subjects. Once we select OK, we can again turn on any data encryption that we may have in place and hit apply. Now that we essentially have a finished product of our process map, we now need to go into how our assets are handling this information. That will include the records and where they are going to be located. On our process map here, our service centre is based in the UK. Our company server, however, is based in the Bahamas, and this is purely to indicate or illustrate in today's demo the transfer of information to a third country. We're going to select our company server here. This will open up another attributes panel very similar to the data transfer items where we can go through and change the asset in which we want it to be illustrated as. Now please note any change you make in these areas will have a global change in your asset library so it can again be used moving forward in future processes. The next option is you can change its name and again this will have a direct impact on your asset library. We can change its operation, whether it is now seen as a controller, if we're going to change this to become a processor, third party, or any of the joint options. The next option is the location as to where this asset is going to be based. We've currently chosen the Bahamas, but again, we have that same location list with more commonly used locations bumped to the top geared for repeatability. As well as the data transfers having the option for comments and data encryption, we can also toggle this on at this stage. So if we're aware that our server uses any form of encryption, we can toggle this on and manually type in what level of encryption we're using. Whilst we're in the right hand side attributes panel, this is where we can add records to the individual assets themselves. We will click here, it will expand the attributes panel where we will be able to see any pre-existing records within that asset. We can add new ones here, or we can simply edit ones that are already pre-existing. Once we're editing or adding a new record, it will ask you to give it its name. We can choose any of the classification types, and these will also include the custom ones illustrated at the beginning. We can then outline what format that information is being stored in, be that digital or physical. We can then outline the retention period, and this can be unknown as a temporary fix. However, you will need to start stipulating whether it's days, weeks, months, or years, and then you can select the number on the left-hand side. Finally, we have a free text area again where you can type in who the recipients of this information is going to be over time. Once we click Save, it will save in a format very similar to this, and once we're happy with the asset overall, we can then simply hit Apply. As we illustrated earlier in our map from our data entry point from our company sales website to our billing team, this was all relatively straightforward as we were handling the information within the EU or within the UK based operations. The transfer here, however, from our service centre in the UK to the company server in the Bahamas is going to include a third country transfer. We will have the same options available, such as the method in which it's being transferred, the data items in which it's handling, any comments, any encryption at this point, and there'll be additional context at the bottom here to include transfer to third countries and whether you have the appropriate safeguards in place or derogations apply. By selecting one of these two, you'll then have an additional drop down box to choose the appropriate uh, safeguard. Alternatively, derogations apply and you'll have that same drop down available to you for the derogations. Once we're happy with all of this information, we can click apply and then we can move on into the process report. Once the process has been completed, as well as the map as well, you are then able to run a report. This report can be exported into a Word document for you to make further modifications to things like your company logos and adding in your own version numbers. Alternatively, you can view it straight away inside the tool and you can print directly from here or export it into a PDF document.
The report is going to cover off the main elements of your process map that we've just created, including section one, the process overview. This will uh, cover off the scope statement, the purpose of processing, and a summary which will include any cross-border processing, any transfers to locations outside the EEA, and the types of lawful basis you're taking into consideration when dealing with your data items. The next section that you will come on to will be section 1.1, which is the map. So this will be a small snapshot that will be included inside the process report for future reference if needed. The next area you're going to come to will be section 1.2, and that's personal data inventory. The rest of this report is now going to be in a table format to make it more digestible and readable to whoever is viewing the document. Here you'll have a list of the data items you're dealing with, the data subjects, the lawful basis, and if dealing with sensitive data items, this will then be populated in the exception column on the far right. The next area you'll come to will be section 1.3, the data subjects, where it will outline the reference, who the data subject is, the location, and also if there's any comments relating to that area as well. Section 1.4 is our asset register, and this will keep track of the name and asset type that we have included in our process map, the location, including their status, You'll then have what they're operating as with a hazard symbol being highlighted next to anybody that is dealing with your information other than the controller of your business. You'll then have any types of encryption that are toggled on at those stages, the records that relate to those assets, followed by any additional comments. Section 1.5 will then give you a table breakdown of your records that will include the name, the classification, the format, the retention period, and the recipients. Under the summary of records, this will also highlight if you have any undefined retention periods across any of your records of your business. Section 1.6 is our transfers, and this will give you a full table breakdown of essentially the process map that's been created in the background. This will include the methods in which the data items are being transferred between your business. You'll then have the data subjects. You'll then have the items that are being handled along those transfers and where they're coming from and where they're being sent to. Again, if there's any encryption, that will also be shown in this column. Any third country transfer information, such as safeguards and standard data protection clauses, as we have highlighted here. And then finally, our comments will be highlighted in the far right column. Well, that covers some of the basics. A fully detailed tutorial of the software from start to finish can be viewed on our YouTube channel. Simply click the link below. For more information, you can view our website at vigilantsoftware.co.uk, email us at support at vigilantsoftware.co.uk, or contact us directly on 0333 700 1700. And of course, subscribe to be updated on new videos, tutorials, and webinars. Thank you for watching.